Hey everyone, today I'm going to be doing one of my uh, question and answer videos. For those of you who haven't seen these before, uh, these are questions that I get directly from my patrons over on Patreon. Uh, so if you'd like to ask questions to be answered in a video format like this, definitely head over to Patreon and become one of the supporters over there. Talk a little bit more about that later. But we got uh, quite a few questions uh, this this time around, uh, theoretically this month. Uh, so let's go ahead and dig right into the first one. So first up we have from Dan, how would you modernize the AK platform? Would you ever consider doing a what would Kalashnikov do project? Uh, just in case you aren't familiar with what he might be referencing there, um, the guys over at InRange TV, which is an excellent channel, I actually support them on Patreon, um, they did a what would Stoner do series, basically how, if, if Eugene Stoner had modern technology and modern materials and all that, how would he build the M16 or AR-15 of today? And it's a really fascinating series. I know they're doing a 2.0 here soon. Um, so Dan's asking basically, what would Kalashnikov do if, if Kalashnikov, uh, Mikhail Kalashnikov had access to modern materials, modern manufacturing techniques, you know, how would he build an AK today? And um, I'm not gonna have a visual aid for me on this one, so I'm just gonna roll in some footage of AKs that I have modernized. And um, I guess just right off the bat, I want to address, I'm not one of those Nyet rifle is fine guys. Uh, I, I do believe in, in any tool I'm going to be using for personal defense. There's certain qualities I want it to have. Uh, ideally being able to mount modern optics to it, like red dots, um, and the ability to mount like lights to them. And so I'm a big fan of like the Ultimac gas tubes or the Midwest Industries railed gas tubes, uh, Midwest Industries handguards in general. I've had those on several of my AKs. Um, Personally, I don't necessarily have an issue with the collapsible butt stocks or extend, expandable butt stocks. The Warsaw pack length stocks have always just kind of worked for me, so I haven't necessarily had a need for that, but I'm not opposed to that. Um, but just kind of my personal take is um, give me some way of mounting an optic, whether it be via a side rail, especially if you want to run a magnified optic, or one of those railed gas tubes like Midwest Industries or Ultimac. Um, really big fan of those and then give me some way of mounting a light whether that be through an M-Lock handguard or just coming off of that uh, railed gas tube. You, you've seen that in a lot of the AKs that I use for any practical purposes or run through classes and I'm, I'm just a really big fan of doing that. As far as doing a what would Stone or excuse me what would Kalashnikov do series um, to me I, I don't feel that I'm in an informed enough position to do something like that. The AK market is changing rapidly, uh, which is awesome. We see more and more products coming out every year, a lot more support for AKs year to year. And um, I feel like if I were to start that project, it'd already be outdated by the time uh, I even got the first video out. But if that's something you guys would like to see, definitely let me know. Uh, I have some subject matter experts that I know in the industry who could probably lead me on a path to victory in that sense. Um, I do have some ideas like, for example, starting with a Sharps Brothers uh, receiver, uh, John Sharps is doing some really, really awesome designs with those uh, AK receivers. And in my opinion, that's probably the best foundation to build off of. And then there's tons of different options out there once you get past that. Uh, so if that's something you'd be interested in, let me know and I'll see if I can maybe put together a project like that. But that would take a lot of uh, research and development on my part. Next up, again from Dan, we have what is your favorite Mauser and or Mauser variant? Now this one, um, I'm just gonna be completely honest with you guys. I don't have a ton of experience with the different styles of Mauser out there. Um, I have a fairly limited experience level, so I guess we'll kind of have to take that into consideration with my answer here. Um, but if we're, if we're talking like the bolt action military Mausers, I would say currently it's the K98. Now this is one you probably haven't seen too much on the channel. This is a very recent addition to my collection. Uh, in fact, I actually bought this from Dan, the person who, who asked the question. And um, really the only other Mauser that I have any significant amount of experience with is my Yugo M48, which I know people get really upset when I call that a Mauser, but for all intents and purposes, it's a Mauser. Um, so what does the K98 do that the Yugo M48s don't do? Um, physically and aesthetically, they are very, very, very similar. However, I think the big thing that the K98 has over the Yugos is the iron sight sight picture. Um, the rear sight aperture, at least on this specific K98, which is, is a Yugo capture, so it's got the, the Yugo markings on it. Um, 
I, for whatever reason, they just work with my eyes better to where I can be a little bit more precise out to extended distances, you know, say 200 yards. I can be just a little bit more precise with the barley corn sight set up with this than I can with the Yugo M48s. Um, that and they're just, aesthetically, they're a beautiful rifle. <laughs> um, there's a podcast that actually one of my other patrons who may have asked a question in this one, we'll see. Um, he did a guest appearance on the Vortex Nation podcast where him and his father brought in a ton of their mill serps, a beautiful collection of firearms. I'll have a link to that video in the description of this one. And um, one of the guys on the podcast mentioned, this just looks like a bad guy gun. And uh, it really does. There's just something about the aesthetics of this. Maybe it's the indoctrination we've gotten from video games and movies here in Western media, um, but it just has that bad guy look to it. And there's something um, I think fascinating about that. Plus, just from a historical context, there's so much history behind these guns, uh, the, the, the K98Ks, um, the Car 98Ks, that it's just, um, I don't know, it's just something to appreciate. Now, obviously, terrible, terrible, terrible things were done uh, by people who carried these, but uh, I don't like to make generalizations about an entire group of people. Maybe an ideology, but not the people themselves and the people who were victims of those ideologies. Um, but I can also appreciate the historical context of firearms like these, and they're also just really phenomenal shooters. So um, currently, I would say my favorite Mauser variant is the uh, Car 98Ks. Again, just a beautiful example of the type and uh, just a real pleasure to shoot. Now, kind of a wild card question I'm going to throw in here. This was actually a question asked of me yesterday at work. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I do work at a gun store. And one of my coworkers asked me, just kind of out of the blue, he said, um, what is your favorite pre-1950 bolt action rifle to shoot? And, or he didn't say to shoot, just kind of in general, my favorite pre-1950 bolt action. And uh, I thought about it for a little bit. And this was kind of the first thing that came to my head. And I kept trying to think of maybe other alternatives other than this, but I kept coming back to this one. And this is my Enfield number four Mark one, uh, chambered in 303 Brit. Uh, I have a dedicated video on this rifle. Um, I just, I really, really, really enjoy shooting these rifles. There's something about the way the action works, that really fast, smooth Enfield action, the 10 round box magazine, the really excellent iron sights. You have a really long sight picture with that peep uh, style rear sight, even with this, with the L flip, not even the notch, uh, the click adjustable one. Um, it's a really good sight picture. You can be fast, you can be accurate with these. 303 Brit isn't a super punishing round. Uh, it's one that you can reload fairly easily. At least I've been able to reload fairly easily. And I know it's gonna sound weird, but there's something about the sound of the Enfield action that's just a little bit more satisfying to me than others. Don't ask me why or what specifically it is, it is about it. There's something about the sound of it picking up that next round and chambering that's for some reason just super satisfying. They're really simple, but they have a beautiful silhouette and again, just a real pleasure to shoot. And um, is it necessarily the best rifle? Um, probably not. It's pretty close up there as far as World War II bolt guns go in my opinion, um, but it's probably my favorite, especially my favorite to shoot. All right, so I'm gonna throw in a little bit of a lighthearted question in here for one of my patrons before we get a little bit uh, more serious here. Uh, and that's from Rick. His question is waffles or pancakes. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and do a little caveat here. I would say if I'm at a restaurant, definitely waffles. If I'm making them myself, definitely pancakes. And so let me elaborate on that. Um, I'm not very good at making waffles. You have to have special, you have to have waffle iron. It's a little bit more of a complicated process and I can never seem to make them just as crispy or perfect as I can at like a, you know, a regular breakfast uh, diner or anything like that. Um, so if I'm making them myself, I like to do the pancakes just way simpler, way easier, way less to go wrong. Um, but if I'm paying someone to, to make the food for me, I'll go with waffles because it's, I, I prefer waffles, but I can make pancakes way better. All right, so this next one, um, I, I, I kind of have two questions here that are asking similar things. I'm gonna try to address them at the same time. Uh, but from Eric, it's, if you had to pick one rifle uh, you own to get out of Dodge, what would it be? And then he also adds any, any rifle you don't own. I'll try to cover that as well. And then also from Rick, we have, 
define, uh, define and specify the best do all AR-15 or AR-10 if you could have only one, uh, include specific accessories, brands, uh, and that this AR would be equipped as well as caliber choice. So again, I think both of these can be answered more or less at the same time and possibly by the same firearm. Uh, so let me dig into that. So the first firearm I'm gonna reference here is this BCM Recce 16. This has been uh, part of my collection for quite a while now, and it's been largely configured the same way for the last couple of years at least. Um, and again, go, Steve, the gentleman who asked me about my favorite pre-1950 bolt gun, he asked me a similar question of if I had to grab one for whatever scenario, what would it be? And it would probably be this one. So first let me explain uh, how I have this set up and why to me that makes it perfect as a kind of both do everything, quote unquote, AR, as well as why it would be my go-to. So first of all, um, it's at its core, it's a standard complete factory BCM rifle. Uh, I'm a self-admitted BCM fanboy. I'm a really big fan of BCM products. I've had zero reason to doubt their reliability or durability or quality or anything like that. I've had phenomenal success with, with everything BCM I've ever owned. And this rifle is obviously no exception. So starting from the front, we still have the standard BCM gunfighter break up here. Haven't changed that. Going back for iron sights, we have the uh, Strike Industries Sidewinder uh, iron sights. These ones are currently set up as 45 degree, but you can also offset them centerline, have a dedicated review on those. And uh, they just work so well with this setup that I've kind of kept them on here. These ones do flip up and I mostly keep them down out of the way. Currently, as far as the light, this is kind of a weird one because generally speaking, I don't recommend Enforced products. I've just had too many of them break. This specifically is one of the HSP models that I got years and years and years ago, and it's just been working. I've had no reason to replace it because it hasn't broken on me yet, and given that, I doubt it will ever break on me, at least uh, not unless something crazy happens. Um, I currently have that mounted at a 45 degree angle off the uh, key mod rail. Unfortunately, um, when I bought this, BCM was not making their M-Lock rails, so it's all key mod. Um, but I, I think it's very, very important to have a light. I have a, just a CAG here, their kinesthetic angled grip, just to, as a reference point to get my hand back to the same place every time. I do have a sling mount built into the side here. And then the optic on top here is a primary arms uh, ACSS 1-6. Now there's gonna be a lot of people who say, why would you get such a expensive rifle and put such a cheap optic on it? And honestly, it's just cause it works. It works very, very well. Um, I got one in for testing from Optics Planet years ago and it's just been phenomenal. I have no issues reaching out to 300 yards with it. That's typically the furthest I shoot. I haven't really tried pressing this thing out further than that, but considering how just, boringly easy it is to hit at 300 yards with this, I would feel very confident going all the way out to you know 500 yards with this. And that's kind of where I see 5.56. Can you do 600 and beyond? Sure, but in my opinion, it's kind of that 500 yards and in. And even then 500 yards is kind of pushing it really 300 yards and in. Uh, it's currently on a quick disconnect Luru mount, but even though it's quick disconnect, um, I still like having the offset irons just so I have an aiming method where I don't have to sit there and pull this optic off. So again, with the rear sight, we have the um, Strike Industries Sidewinder. Um, I do have a bad lever. I have a video talking about why I like the bad levers. Mostly, I only use them to lock the bolt open. I don't use them to release it, so I haven't run into the same issues that some of the people out there talk about. Um, the trigger, I have a Geisley SSA-E. Um, phenomenal trigger. Uh, there's a lot of really good drop-in triggers out there, but if it's a game time AR, um, I want a Geisley. I just trust Geisley just wholeheartedly. I have zero, zero, zero hesitance trusting my life to a Geisley. It's just kind of that simple. Um, this one has the Noveski slash Magpul short throw ambi safety. Back when I got this, there weren't as many short throw ambi safeties out there. So um, I just got this one and it's worked so well for me. I haven't replaced it. Same BCM charging handle, same BCM stock. Um, largely this is still Internally, the same configuration from the factory, just kind of added some of the exterior stuff here. So why do I consider this a do-everything AR? So 
If I'm trusting my life to an AR or if I'm using it for any serious purpose, there's a couple things, in my opinion, it has to have. First of all, you have to have some way to aim it. So iron sights and or optic, preferably and. Um, I, I always want iron sights as a backup, but I like having some sort of optic. Now, I when I first got this, I ran this with just a red dot and I was able to hit up to 300 yards with a red dot just fine. So I thought, why do I need a magnified optic? Well, um, I figured positive target identification is an extremely important thing and uh, it's kind of hard to tell the difference between, say, an umbrella and a rifle at 300 yards sometimes. So being able to clearly identify targets and also be able to identify targets that aren't standing out in the middle of the open uh, is way easier when you have six times magnification. Even four times is, is better than just straight red dots. Now, depending on your environment, you might not need six times magnification, which I'll kind of get into with kind of the other alternative option I have. Um, but I just really like having that extra magnification, again, just for positive identification and being a lot more precise with my shots and a lot more confident with my shots out, you know, 300 yards and beyond. Um, the other thing is a light. The light is, again, goes along with that positive target identification, especially in a home defense context. There's a lot of nonsense out there about, oh, lights will give away your position. Um, if you know how to use them correctly, that's not as big of a deal. And I would still rather make sure the person I'm shooting is a bad guy than have to live with myself making a mistake when I didn't give away my position. So that's kind of my take on it. So now that I've kind of run over this 16 inch one, um, let me go into what an alternative might be. So depending on your context, depending on where you're at, something a little shorter might be a little bit better. Oh, by the way, the last one is in 5.56. This one is also 5.56. And I'll explain 5.56 in a second. Um, so this is a complete BCM upper Noticing any trends here. Um, this is an 11 and a half inch barrel um, on a Spikes Tactical SBR lower, um, just because that's what I'd had SBR'd. You're probably gonna notice some common trends here, um, but up front here we have a uh, Strike Industries sail comp. I'm probably gonna be swapping this out with a flash hider, or at least a better combo break slash flash hider, just so it's not as concussive, uh, at least for the people around me. Uh, I have Midwest Industries flip up iron sights. These are their vertical ones. Really big fan of those. I have a video on those coming hopefully soon. A Streamlight Protac Rail 1. I'm an enormous fan of these lights. I own three of them now. I've paid full retail price for all of them. Uh, actually, in the last one, I get, got an employee discount at the gun store, so I guess can't say full retail price. Normally full retail price, and I'm more than happy to pay for these. I'm probably gonna be getting a couple more here soon. Currently, I have it running with the tape switch up on top of the rail. BCM vertical grip down here, again, just as kind of a reference point to get my hand back to the same spot and get me in position for the light. Up top here, I have a primary arms uh, advanced micro dot. Again, people are gonna say, you paid that much for uh, an SBR and you're gonna put a primary arms red dot on it. Once again, I have zero it reason to question these. I have a full review on it, but long story short, thousands and thousands of rounds through all types of weather conditions and never once had an issue. Haven't gotten the advertised battery life out of it, but as long as I change the battery once a year, I'm, I'm more than okay. Um, that is currently sitting on an ADM mount, but Midwest Industries also makes really great mounts. Again, Magpul Bad Lever, uh, only use it to lock it open. A Geisley G2S, the Geisley 2 stage trigger in here. Again, noticing some trends here. Magpul slash Noveski short throw ambi safety. Again, noticing some trends here. Uh, again, Midwest Industries rear sight. Currently have the Strike Industries uh, charging handle on it. And recently, uh, up until very recently, I was running this with the uh, Strike Industries PDW stock, but I really just found myself not needing a PDW style stock. And I like the comfort of a traditional stock. So I went back to one of these Magpul, I think this is the SL, SLS stock. Uh, really like it, it's really comfortable. It gives me storage for my for my Form 1, uh, a copy of my Form 1, I should say, uh, just in case someone wants to give me a hard time. Again, this rifle you've seen a ton on the channel as well. Run it through classes. Again, have zero reason to, to question the uh, legitimacy of this setup. So why 5.56? Five, five, um, first of all, uh, it's, uh, it's a caliber that I'm very familiar with. With both of these rifles, I know what my holdovers, holdovers have to be, which especially at the 300 yards, it's such a flat shooting cartridge, there's really not much of a holdover to speak of. Um, but the other big thing is it's 
just prevalent. It's gonna be everywhere, at least in where I live here in the United States, here in Oregon, um, there's just 5.56 ammo everywhere. There's no want for 5.56 ammo. So it's something I can readily get my hands on and I know how to shoot it well and competently. Um, are there other calibers that are better for other situations? Sure, but it's either gonna be harder to get a hold of or you know more expensive for me to stock up on. One of those things that's just gonna make it a little bit less viable in my opinion. Now, as far as why someone might wanna go with a little shorter gun here than the full 16 inch, um, it's really just kind of depending on your environment. If the furthest you're gonna be shooting is 150, 200 yards, a little short barrel rifle is not gonna be a problem and a red dot will most likely be fine. Personally, again, if I can get some magnification, I like it, but I don't feel necessarily undergunned with something like this. Now, if you have to start reaching out, that shorter barrel and losing that velocity is gonna start playing, uh, having an impact. So just something to keep in mind and something to weigh for yourself. If the furthest you're shooting is 150 to 200 yards, you could probably get away with something like this. But if you're expecting more, you know, long distance engagements, you definitely wanna at least go with a full 16, if not a little bit longer, just to still keep that ballistic effectiveness out to further distances. Now to briefly touch on um, one, if one I don't own, going back to Eric's original question, um, instead of going on what I don't own in an ideal world, what would it be? It'd probably be a 5.45 gun, like an AK-74, whether in the 16 inch or the crank off style, um, depending again on whether you're dealing with 200 yards and in or 300 yards plus. Um, the reason that's not one of my primaries is just ammo availability. 545 still isn't super prevalent here in the States, at least not where I live and maybe where you are. Um, so not being able to find the ammo everywhere is kind of a little bit of a deterrent. Yeah, I can stock up on it, but it's not gonna be able to go with me everywhere because uh, ammo does weigh quite a lot, especially in bulk. So the last question I have once again is from Rick and it is basically discuss your choice of a car or truck or trunk gun, uh, which would be in addition to whatever carry pistol you have, discuss the ammo choice for said firearm, how you would carry the ammo if you carry more than what actually fits in the gun and what's my reasoning for that. And um, so I think there's a lot of options here and it really depends on your context and your situation and what kind of environment you live in. Um, I mean, for some people having a nine millimeter carbine that takes the same mags as their carry gun is gonna be an excellent option for a truck gun because then you can um, just rock and roll with the same mags, maybe have some extended versions, especially for Glocks and be able to rock and roll with everything. You only have to carry one style of mag and you're good to go. Um, for some people in like an urban setting, that might be a good choice. For people that live in a more rural area, maybe you want something in a rifle caliber to be able to more better augment that carry gun you already have. Because if, again, if you're in one of those flat, you know, flyover states, you, don't, you can only shoot so far effectively with a Glock 19. Maybe you want a rifle to be able to bridge that gap out to some of those longer line of sight targets. So for me specifically, what would be my ideal choice for a truck or trunk or car gun? Um, Personally, the way I've been really leaning with something like this is something in an AK pistol, uh, specifically the one I've been looking at getting. Um, probably wouldn't use it for this, but what I've been thinking of getting is one of those uh, Romanian Draco AK pistols and basically configuring that to be that context of gun. Um, so why do I choose that? First of all, uh, AKs are something that you don't lose as much of the ballistic effectiveness from losing velocity in a shorter barrel. So I can go to like a 12 inch barrel in a Draco and still have a lot of that ballistic effectiveness. Again, you're not getting 100% of it, but you're getting a good portion of it. You're not losing as much as you do in a 5.56 when you start chopping that barrel down. So in a 12 inch Draco, I'm still getting a lot of that ballistic effectiveness. Also, uh, the 7.62 by 39 round is just a really good <laughs> intermediate cartridge. It's really good at barrier defeating. Um, it's also just pretty dang good uh, terminal ballistics. That you uh, ballistics on target. And um, depending on the environment you live in, you might want to choose different types of ammo for that. So uh, there's a type of ammo, um, I'll put it over here because I can't think of what it's called, but it's basically like almost like a frangible ammo you can get for AKs. And if you live in a more uh, urban setting, maybe that's a really good choice because you don't want to be going through walls and injuring innocent bystanders. You want to really 
uh, isolate your target and make sure you're getting positive effect on target. So that might be a really good choice. If you live out in the boonies, maybe you want something like a Hornady SST or something like that. Something that's going to still have um, good penetration abilities while also maintaining good terminal ballistics. And then honestly, a lot of people are probably just going to run the regular FMJs or hollow points or anything like that. Now, granted, the traditional regular hollow points you get for AKs isn't like hollow points you carry in a handgun. Ballistically, it doesn't perform that way. Um, but it's also going to be perfectly acceptable for most applications. Again, in an urban setting, maybe not, because you're dealing with a lot of overpenetration in that context. Um, but for rural or just kind of that all over the place, uh, that, that might not be a bad choice. Now, as far as how to carry ammo, I probably would if I have something in that situation, because I guess I should clarify, for me, a truck gun is something I need immediate access to and is not necessarily a long-term fighting tool. So it's at, at most something to help fight me back home. Um, so if something, if the North Koreans invade uh, while, while I'm at work, which if they invaded again, as I've always said, if they take one look at one of our supermarkets and you know, seek asylum because they don't realize how much food we have. Um, but in that kind of situation um, where people are parachuting in behind like the, the uh, Red Dawn situation, I need something to help get me home to then get to something that I can then do whatever I need to else from there. So uh, what I would run, personally what I do run is one of those strike hard gear chest rigs allows me four rifle mag pouches in the front. I have an admin pouch in the back and I've added other Molly pouches to the front to help kind of augment that. Um, and then I'd probably also have a medical kit in my everyday carry. So that again will hopefully be sufficient to get me home. Again, this, the goal of a truck gun is either deal with an immediate threat or help at most help me fight my way home. Um, and in that context, I see one of those little AK pistols being excellent for that. If you want an SBR, God bless, do whatever you want. The harder thing with an SBR is if you're going on a road trip or anything like that, um, you do have to deal with the NFA laws. So as a pistol, you can more easily cross state lines uh, as long as you're going into a state that's friendly to it, legally speaking. Um, it's not as much of an issue. So just something to consider there. Now, the biggest thing to consider when we're talking about truck guns or trunk guns or car guns is uh, secure storage. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of us know, a lot of felons get their guns by stealing it from law-abiding citizens. So the people who put all the gun stickers on their car, they'll always argue this. I don't get why. That uh, that doesn't make it more of a target for car thieves and anything else like that. It absolutely does. It's absolutely demonstrable. There have been many, many cases where that's happened. Um, so A, don't label your gun or don't label your car to let everyone know you have a gun in it. And B, don't just leave it laying around in the in the trunk of your car. If you're gonna have it, especially in like a car that's going to be exposed to the air or like where you can look through the windows, have some sort of secure locking device that mounts to the frame of the car. There's a lot of good options out there that will actually mount to the frame of your car so someone can't just grab it and walk away. Um, because even if it's in a locked container, if they can just smash the window, grab it and walk away, now they can break into that lock at their leisure in whatever situation they find themselves comfortable in. So um, have some secure way of storing it, which is why I typically don't have a truck gun. I don't have something that I can't take into my job with me or anything like that um, because I don't want to leave myself open to having something stolen like that. Because again, it is irresponsible of me to put the, the public in that situation. And again, I just don't feel comfortable having that on my conscience. So. Thankfully, I work at a gun store, so I'm pretty uh, able to bring in basically anything I need to. Um, but I know most people aren't in that context, so if you're going to do that, just make sure you have secure storage for that. So that's going to wrap it up for, for this month's question and answer. Uh, I say this month's, I'm, I'm trying to do them every month. Sometimes I'm better about that than others, as you can probably tell if you look back at my other question and answer videos. Um, and as I said at the beginning of this video, all of these questions come directly from my patrons over on Patreon. And my coworker Steve, if you come in, uh, he, you know, he, he might get you some some interesting questions. So, um, if you want to again contribute questions to these question and answer videos, definitely head over to my Patreon. Um, the people over there are is really making my productivity on the channel possible. YouTube demonetization is absolutely a thing. In fact, today I got a whole nother wave of like 80 more videos getting demonetized that I'm going having now to go through the process of appealing, which I'm probably gonna lose most of those appeals just because they get to make up whatever qualifies for demonetization. 
Um, so the people over there are what makes it possible for me to continue buying ammo for tests, buying guns to review and all that stuff. So I really do appreciate what they're doing over there. So because of that, we do live streams. We do uh, Patreon exclusive videos where I give them updates on guns that I'm reviewing. Um, we do uh, all the content over there early. So if I'm posting a review, typically the patrons over there will get it a day or two early. And, um, you know, other than that, just being able to, oh, we also have a Discord server. Um, so if you want to have more direct interaction with me, uh, we do have a Discord server set up so we can have a lot more of that kind of free interaction. And there's a lot of really knowledgeable people that support me on Patreon. So if I can't answer a question by putting it over on the Discord server, you'll get a lot of really good input over there. And it's just kind of a neat little community we have going on. Um, or if you just want to financially support the channel, which is much appreciated, definitely check out the uh, my link to Patreon. Again, it, it, without Patreon, I would not be able to do videos at the rate that I currently am. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and check that out over there. And again, because of the whole new wave of demonetization and as a show of appreciation to my patrons, at the end of the video, I'm just gonna go ahead and roll through at least the first names of uh, all the people supporting me over there. Uh, and again, I really, really do appreciate it. So again, I'll try not to get on my soapbox about that too much. But again, the, the patrons are what make this possible, hence why I'm answering their questions exclusively in these video contexts, at least. And we definitely have a couple more. They, they uh, ran some really good ideas by me as far as questions that I feel are going to be better suited to be answered in a whole dedicated video. So definitely be on the lookout for those. Um, and if this is your first question and answer video, uh, I will have the playlist at the end of this video. Uh, so go ahead and check out the other ones if you feel so inclined. But anyway, with all that said, as always, I hope you got something out of this video and I really appreciate you watching. Boy!